So we had talked in 1.1 about this idea of productive resources being scarce. But we also have to combine that with the idea that people have essentially unlimited wants and needs. So if those factors of production, those productive resources, capital, land, labor, all of those things that we use in order to make goods and services, if they're scarce, we've got to make some decisions about how we're going to use the scarce resources in order to produce some amount of goods and services to satisfy wants and needs of the people. Now, every single society, when they look at the amount of resources and which resources they have available to themselves, they have to decide how are they going to allocate or how are they going to distribute and use those scarce resources in order to produce goods and services. And every single society has to ask themselves three different questions about allocating those scarce resources. First, they must ask themselves, what is it that we are going to produce? Using these resources, what goods and services should be produced? Second, how should those things be produced? What methods, uh, or should we use in order to make the goods and services? And finally, once we produce those goods and services, who's going to get them? For whom should those be produced? Now, when we look at these three questions, the system or the way, kind of like the who, of who's answering these questions in regards to what's going to be produced, how's it going to be produced, and who's going to get it, the way in which those questions are answered provides for us a context as to what is the economic system within that society. Now, if we look at this, we can kind of understand economic systems across a spectrum. So looking at this spectrum of economic systems and with regards to who is answering those questions, we could look at it on kind of two sides. One, you could have the government is in complete control of answering the questions of what, how, and for whom to produce. On the other side, you have no government control. The government is not involved at all in deciding the what, the how, and the for whom. Now, if we were to kind of stretch this out across the spectrum, we can kind of categorize um, three different economies. If we look at the two far extremes, like the complete extreme of total government control, we would have a pure command economy. In a pure command economy, the government or some sort of central planning authority, they own and allocate those resources. They decide what, how, and for whom, right? What are we going to produce? How are we going to produce? And who's going to get it? The government or some central planning agency is making those decisions. Maybe another way you can think about it is that the decisions are being made for the people instead of by the people. Now, historically, the goal of this is to promote equality. You're saying, hey, if the government's making these decisions, people are getting as much as they need, maybe no more, no less. Um, and that's, again, the goal on paper. And, and we've seen historically maybe it hasn't worked out that way. Um, but we've also never really seen in its absolute purest form a command economy exist. We've seen um, you know, elements or, or, or societies that are leaning um, further that direction, but never, again, in its absolute purest form. And the same can be said for a market economy, a market economy um, where we see that the government has no control or no ownership over resources. We've seen that's never truly existed in its absolute purest form where the government only exists to protect private property, right? We see that the decisions of the what, the how, and the for whom are made through voluntary exchange in markets with buyers and sellers. And so what we say is that the, the what, the how, and the for whom, those decisions are made through markets. As people say, hey, I want more of this thing, um, you know, sellers will respond and that changes the what is being produced, right? Um, and who's going to get it is also determined within those markets as well. We'll dive more into that as we get into supply and demand later on in unit two. So what we see there is the decisions are instead made by the people, not just for the people. A mixed economy, though, we see is where nearly every other global system ends up falling because we see no one is truly at this purest form one way or the other. Most every global system has elements of both. Now, again, the, the degree to which they have elements of both varies, but we see that they all have you know, these characteristics of both where there is you know, decisions being made by the people, but the government still has some sort of involvement. For the most part, resources are privately owned. Right. 
um, the, the, this capital entrepreneurship land and labor for the most part are owned by people and the buyers and sellers then are determining how to allocate those resources. But we end up seeing the government is still involved. Maybe they are involved uh, within different markets through, you know, taxes and subsidies. Maybe it's that they're involved through regulations. Maybe there's some government corporations, you know, we see that in the United States, which like the USPS or maybe your local government, uh, is in charge of, of you know water or utilities within the city. Um, we see that the government is involved within um, maybe certain markets, uh, maybe with certain products, and the government has some sort of level of involvement. Now, if you were to compare different global economies across the world, the degree to which the government invol is involved does vary. And so that's where we see it's kind of this sliding scale between command and market, but pretty much every system we uh, discuss is mixed in some way because they have elements of both.